Okay, so thank you everybody for joining. And we are very honored today to have uh, Luke Steele as a speaker. So Luke Steele is uh, the founder of uh, Sony CSL Paris. So we are very glad uh, to have him to, to talk today. And uh, he is now a research professor at ICREA in uh, Barcelona. And uh, I think he also has some strong links with uh, VUB and uh, um, University in Venice also, I think. And uh, he is a leading researcher in uh, robotics and computational linguistics and cognitive science, actually. He was my teacher when I was a student in cognitive science, so uh, I've been knowing his work for quite a while. And today he will uh, talk to us about a, a very uh, interesting topic, how can uh, AI, AI make sense of art? So thank you, Lucille, again, and the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, David, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vittorio, and everybody else from uh, CSL uh, who is here. Uh, I regret, of course, very much that um, I cannot be with you. Uh, wait a minute, because I lost uh, the screen. D do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't see you, So, but I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, so I regret very much that I cannot be in, in Paris and uh, it would have been a very nice occasion to, to visit everybody. Um, okay, um, so the, the title of my talk is uh, Can AI Make Sense of Art? And um, uh, I'm not alone doing this, uh, the work that I'm going to talk about. There's some other people, uh, in particular, Sinem uh, Aslan and others that have helped with some of the computer vision and uh, pattern recognition. And so basically, we hear a lot about AI, many promises, you know, there's an incredible wave of hype. I think this, this hype is based on um, a sort of narrative about AI, which is not really uh well there's something real to it but at the same time there's a lot of exaggeration and science fiction and expectations which which i think are not justified and um so there's a question how far are we advanced and uh, the second question is also that well people who who go on about ai how how you know everybody is going to rich uh, become rich by using it etc et they agree that current AI is very specialized. Uh, it's basically uh, a lot of optimization for very specific uh, targets. And they also agree that uh, with respect to computational creativity, AI is not really where, uh, where it's comparable with uh, human intelligence. So this is sort of the questions I would like to raise. And from my own point of view, I think uh, the, the key bottleneck, the, the glass ceiling for AI is really that it cannot adequately handle meaning and understanding. Uh, in fact, many applications, they try to avoid meaning and understanding. You know, if you use uh, Google Translate, for example, well, it's doing um, uh, matching and of, of uh, and grams and, and doing surface, a little bit of parsing maybe, but very little. Uh, it's basically has a big dictionary of, of patterns in one language and another, and it's, it's kind of uh, mapping them onto each other, but it is certainly not trying to understand what you are saying before it's translated. The same is true for uh, image understanding. Well, understanding, it's not understanding. I mean, like, um, segmentation and labeling and all that. It's done using statistical methods. Uh, and, and this gives sometimes very funny results. You know, it's it's actually possible to change one pixel and, and then something that's labeled as a dog can become, I don't know, a horse or or even a car or something completely different. So so there is, uh, because of this, AI is, is not very robust and um, it, it's behaving in a weird way in, uh, in, in some cases. Now, 
and I would say also that human creativity, the way we know it, is actually very much out of reach for AI. So this is the the theme. And then uh, the way I approach the topic is by looking at artworks and um, trying to understand more and more specifically at visual arts, but you could just as well do this for music. And if I would have more time, then, then I would actually do it. Uh, maybe I can do it in the future. So the, the question is really that these processes of creation and interpretation of artworks how do they work from a mechanistic point of view? So, you know, what algorithms are involved? Could we conceive that would interpret interpret an artwork more or less the way that we would do it? Um, the second question is, uh, how can we push the limits of AI to handle meaning and understanding better? And uh, well, art, uh, you can have artworks without any meaning but uh, most of them they actually convey meaning they are about uh, you know the artist wants to mean something and uh, so it's a good uh, field to 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 push uh, it this boundary you know to push this limit of ai so now uh, first some uh, foundations and then i will talk about one case study now, foundations, well, we can go on for hours about what AI is. Um, so let me give some examples so that we know what we're talking about. OK, this is a painting. And it's a painting by uh, Caravaggio, who is uh, well recognized as, as, you know, one today. He's recognized as one of the great painters of the uh, Baroque period. Um, and so if we look at this painting, of course, then, then there are different levels to, to look at it. Um, so one, one level is that of the, the color patches, the lines, the uh, brightness. Uh, so this is the, the, the purely perceptual level, you could say, um, the level of sensation. But then very quickly, we start to to try to, to see what this painting is about, right? We, we recognize figures um, like, uh, well, here is a figure. Uh, we see a, a hand here belonging, I guess, to this uh, character here. And uh, there's this uh, person also with the hand stretching out. And so we, we begin to look at factual meanings at what is being represented. And now, in order to, to make sense of, of this scene, we, we have to go further because, yeah, we see a number of people, but what are they doing, you know? Uh, we try to figure out, and often the title of the work is, is helping. So the title is Presa di Cristo nel Orto, which means the taking of Christ uh, in the garden. Now, I mean, everybody with, with a European uh, culture, even if you're not very religious, you immediately realize that this figure is Christ being taken prisoner in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane. Um, you know, and, and this is a key event in, in, the, in the Passion story, which is central to uh, the, the Catholic uh, religion. And so, uh, so then, we, we realize also that this is uh, Judas, you know, and the soldier coming to arrest Christ. And this uh, person here is uh, is a, one of the apostles who was with Jesus at the moment this happened and, and so on. So uh, we also begin to see the, the, the expression because there's an expressive layer here. This, this, uh, the leftmost individual is crying out, you know, this hand here. Uh, we see uh, Christ with the hands you know, ringing, which is a sign of, of uh, distress and, and uh, not knowing what to do, actually. Um, you know, we see the, the, uh, the kissing uh, events. And then there is this figure here to the right hand side, which is actually uh, giving light to the scene. And it turns out that this is a self-portrait of uh, Caravaggio who likes to put himself into his own paintings. 
Uh, this is a sort of meta level, right? Where, where the painter puts himself in the painting as an observer of, of a particular scene. And so you see that all these levels of meaning that are beginning to come up, and I, I'm only partly uh, sketching them here because there, there are many more. Um, and, and of course, there's an intention of the painter. Uh, this, this painting has, has a motivation. It's, it's about a spiritual, uh, you know, the, the, the passion story, uh, the, the narrative of Christ being... Um, taken prisoner and all these kinds of things. So, so when we are, when we are talking about a, a work of art, we could say, or looking at the work of art, we, we can say that it triggers a process of, of meaning creation in, in our own minds. And um, the, the great works of art are, are the ones that, you know, uh, I mean, Schoenberg talk, talked about the labyrinth, you know, it's, it's a, you're looking for the meanings, you're trying to, to decipher them, to decode them. And of course, the more you, you see, the more you, you, you can experience the, the, the violence here, the, the black being used for the soldiers who are kind of uh, anonymous, you know, and, and so on. Okay, so, so this is, um, I'm saying nothing new here. I mean, uh, one uh, well-known art historian uh, Erwin Panofsky uh, identified these various levels that that I'm actually uh, sketched out for this particular painting, going to the material and then the motives, the the, the sort of rec recognizable elements, the factual level, the expressive level, cultural level, and the motivational level. Now I can tell the same story about music, and because this is a uh, invitation of the music group, I, I thought I would give uh, an example of music here. And so this is another um, work uh, by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, which is one of, again, a, a Baroque a composer, one of the, uh, uh, you know, incredible composers that has ever lived. And the Matthäus Passion is, is one of his most uh, brilliant works. And actually here you, you see the, the same scene as, as depicted in the Caravaggio painting. Uh, you see Judas here and, you know, gegrüßet seitz to Rabbi, uh, uh, you know, you, you are uh, gr greeted uh, uh, Rabbi and, um, and he kissed him. And Jesus uh, said, uh, well, my friend, why are you here? You know, and then they, these are the, the soldiers, they come, they put their hand on Jesus and they take him. And this is here, it's sort of taught in, a, well, I mean, the composition is very, uh, it's a um, uh, kind of uh, low key, I would say, because there's no violence, there's no, uh, you know, it's being told by the uh, evangelist. But then very soon after that, uh, the, there is again talking about you know how Jesus is is uh, is uh, taken, and the choir is beginning to 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 become active. You know this is last in altet bindet nicht. Uh, this is leave him, stop, uh, don't don't take him. So they are they are beginning to intervene, but then the real action is coming. Um, you know very soon after that where. And this is a, an extract that I'm, I'm going to let you hear, which is the um, is the the uh, lightning and thunder uh, that is uh, appearing on the sky, and so this is the piece that we're going to 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 listen to, and you know it, it is this this rhythm, sin blitzes in donner in Wolken verschwunden, you know, and then. As then the it begins with the, the bass, of course, because we are it's the thunder, it's low sounds, and then it's in blitze, donner, uh, and then the tenors come in, the, the sopranos and the alto sopranos come in, and you know it's sort of building up like a like a thunderstorm. Um, and it is actually the, the painting by Caravaggio was uh, figurative, and, and this is also a figurative in, in the same way. Uh, but it's done with music instead of with um, with uh, with well 
with uh, visual elements. So I suggest that we, we somebody if somebody could play the, the first. Uh, So you get the idea, right? Um, do you still see my screen? Yes. OK, uh, you, you get the idea, right? So in music, it's actually you have all these levels as well. And um, uh, when when you have a, a great uh, musical piece like like the Matthäus Passion, you can uh, follow at all these levels and experience uh, this work because it's not just rational, right? It's also this, this uh, expressive level, uh, the, the the thunder and, and the lightning that that is coming. So, so this is what uh, I mean when I'm going to talk about art in this uh, talk here. I want to give a second example. Now the sound is not so great, I should say, but I hope that you at least get some idea. OK, this is another uh, piece, a musical piece uh, by uh, Richard Strauss, a German composer again. And this is from another period. It's actually much more recent. Um, and uh, Strauss has written a number of uh, tone poems, as he called it. And the most famous ones are the Via Let's the Leader. These are the four last songs. And uh, we're going to look at the last one, which is uh, Im Abendrot, which means like, you know, Abendrot is the uh, evening, the red sky of the evening as the sun is going under. Um, I mean, to me, the, this, uh, this, this fearless leader and also Im Abendrot are among the most uh, uh, impressive compositions of the 20th century. And so Strauss wrote them in 1949, a few uh, months actually before he died. And he used um, a poem by Josef von Eichendorf. Now, we're not going to go into great detail in, in this poem, but we are just going to look at one small part of it. Um, and so I will first uh, translate. So, rings sich die Tele neigen uh, around us, the, the valleys they bow. Uh, as dunkel schon die Luft, the uh, the air is is already becoming dark. Uh, zwei Lerche nur noch steigen, two larks, uh, they they go up, and they are uh, nach träumend in den Duft, uh, they are dreaming in, into the uh, into the air, and so uh, this is this well this is the image right we have the the valleys. And so he talks about the valleys are bowing, which happens when I'm sure you had this experience that when it was getting dark, the 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 value is getting these these mountains are sort of becoming darker before the sky becomes dark, and it it gives the impression of the bowing. And he talks about two larks that are in the sky flying uh, up in the sky. So this is in the poem, in the words, but, you know, like in opera, words and, and music is very tightly uh, interacting with each other. So it is important to to, to know the, the, the poem and possibly uh, look at the translation of it. Um, so this is, uh, again, I mean, this is, a you know, an invitation of the music group. So I... I uh, I, I dare to also show some some uh, scores here. And so this is the uh, uh, rings sich die Täler neigen uh, as dunkel schon die Luft, which is here. And as dunkel schon die Luft, uh, this is an uh, amplification of this part here. Now you see here, um, and, and what you will hear, because I will let you hear this fragment, is that, of course, the uh, 
here in the, in the lower bus instruments, you know, you see the the um, uh, the melodies are are going down what they are playing. Um, but you also see that uh, as Dunkel shown the Luft, you should really try to to hear that because uh, the tempo is changing with respect to the line before it. And uh, but also the tonality is is changing. Um, and also uh, right after that, you should listen and and then here you you hear flutes, you hear two flutes, you know, and these are, are of course, uh, the zwei Lerche nur noch stein, the, the, the two larks are going up in the air, and these are birds, right, larks. And so yeah, the, the larks, it's like in the Bach um, thunder and lightning, it's, it's figurative. The, the flute is not just there by accident, it is because uh, it's it's the singing of the larks. The larks, by the way, are the only birds that actually sing when they move up into the sky. And um, and so then uh, it goes on. Well, first you hear the flutes, and then so I like Nuremberg and then you hear these flutes more in the background. Um, so I, I suggest that we listen to to the the second uh, small excerpt. It's it's very short. Um, and but I recommend that that later you know you you listen again not just once but many times to this particular okay. This is the flutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sorry about the quality of the sound. Um, you know, I think Microsoft is trying to boycott our uh, this talk here at CSL. Um, anyway. Um, okay. So you you see the idea right now. That there's a something that uh, we also need from uh, semiotics, because semiotics is the is the research area that uh, has been looking at at meaning and how language or uh, artworks um, how they 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 deal with meaning and one of the fundamental concepts in semiotics which actually goes back to the linguist uh, de Saussure is the notion of a signifier and a signifier is is like an element so in in music uh, for example the these these flute uh, solos, the two flutes, there are two because there are two larks, it is a signifier, a, uh, you know, a carrier of meaning, you can say. And so the thing that uh, the meaning is then called the signified, um, uh, so that, you know, what the signifier evokes. And there are two things possible. One is called the denotation and the other the connotation. And so. Here, obviously, the, the flutes, they are um, signifying these larks. Uh, but there's a connotation also because the, you know, why, why the larks? Uh, and the lark is actually a symbol for a long time in literature, in mythology, for a lot of things, for the soul rising after death, uh, freedom from embodiment, messenger of the gods, love, the beginning of a new day, reaching of higher goals, freedom, and so on. So uh, now in this case, you know, in Abendrot, it's uh, actually Strauss is, is talking about his life or is using a, uh, a journey, uh, a walk, actually, to, to talk about life. And he's now talking about the end of life, the end of the day, uh, the sun going under, and so the the larks together for himself and his wife are like the uh, the souls rising after death, you know, uh, becoming free from embodiment, and so um, so all these kinds of symbolism and uh, is 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 present in the poem and and in the uh, the composition by uh, by Strauss, and well. 
the, the notion of signifier is, is very general, of course, uh, but notice by immediately that um, the, the signifier, you, you have to know these things, you know, they, they um, of course, birds and uh, flutes, I mean, that association is related to the fact that the flute sounds like a bird, but, but all these connotations, they're part of our culture. And in other cultures, the lark, larks may mean totally different things. So, so th this, this uh, an artwork is strongly embedded in a particular culture, uh, just like, I don't know, the, the dress in, in Africa, I mean, it means something. We, we don't see it, but the people in that culture, they see it and, and they know it. Um, and well, you may think that um, uh, the, the, uh, this lark and so on, but, and this connotation is old fashioned, but actually uh, maybe some of you have a tattoo and, and you're familiar with the lark, which is a big symbol in the tattoo world. Uh, to mean the same sort of things, including love, for example. Um, and so the, these uh, symbols are still present uh, also in, in uh, let's say, popular culture. OK, so given all that, then we can say, OK, creativity, what, what does it mean? Well, I think there, we have to make a distinction between creativity for the viewer and creativity for the creator of the artwork. And as I already said, you know, the, 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 the goal of the artwork is to stimulate uh, experiences which can by themselves already be uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, but the, the, you know, it is becoming art when, when they trigger an interpretation process uh, that is spinning this web of meanings at all these different levels. And um, OK, now, if, if we define it like that, then we can say, well, what about uh, can AI systems help to produce art objects? Uh, by the way, I use the term AI system for a computational system that has some AI algorithms in it. Um, of course, an, an AI system has also a lot more things than, than AI algorithms, but anyway. OK, so can it produce art objects? And then I would say yes, because it turns out that uh, we, we try to find meaning, even if it's not there, even if it's not intentional. And um, if a computer, uh, you know, you have a program and it, com it comes up with some sort of work, then we cannot help it. We, we try to you know, it will give us an experience. We can find it boring, but it gives an experience. And um, and whether we we start to try and make an interpretation, even if the interpretation is not intentional. Now, if we say, uh, can AI systems experience and interpret art the way that I have been talking about? Well, then I guess everybody would agree that this is not the case. Particularly uh, because the, the interpretation uh, also requires creativity. I mean, you know, you can, uh, you have people who go to an art gallery and they look for two minutes at a, at a painting and, well, two minutes, two seconds, and then they go to the next one. I mean, they don't see anything. They are not really engaging with, with the artwork. But so, uh, so it requires creativity, it, it requires attention and uh, investing yourself. But uh, I guess most of you would agree with, with me here that this kind of interpretation, like of the Matthäus Passion, involves so much cultural and, um, you know, other kinds of, of knowledge of the world, uh, uh, common sense knowledge, experiences of, of the reality, that uh, these are not accessible to AI. Well, not at the moment, and you know, we can wonder whether this will ever be the case. But then creativity for the, the author, the painter, or the composer. Um, so here I would say that the, the artist is it's like a cognitive engineer, in fact. This is uh, an idea that uh, Marilyn Donald, who is a uh, uh, psychologist um, 
uh, anthropologist uh, once uh, propagated, and I, I think it's a, it's an interesting idea, which is that it's a cognitive engineer in the sense that somebody knowledgeable knowledgeable about how to manipulate our mental processes. And uh, not just like that, but in order to get certain effects, you know, and the, the, um, the for example, uh, invoking emotions or creating a figurative uh, work that that can be recognized as such. And um, now then we can ask again the uh, whether AI systems can help in this creative process, and there I, I think the answer is yes, because like uh, I mean, th those of you who write music, they they know that uh, to write a score like the one of Strauss, the the uh, Fearless the Leader is just uh, an amazingly complex design process, and so uh, these composers they they did all this, uh, but it's it's magical, you know and. But today we have a lot of tools that can help us so that even somebody like me who doesn't have a lot of time can write compositions. Um, but then can can AI systems be creative in in the sense of, of the human uh, artist, you know, the uh, and then I would say no, because the um, again, this this whole experience and, and cultural knowledge and then the uh, the the uh, practice you know the, the artistic methods they are so sophisticated it's just incredible that uh, somebody can take this this all these meanings this web of meanings and then translate that into uh, an artwork um, I mean that that is what the artist is doing. And so there I'm, I'm a little bit more pessimistic, which doesn't mean that we cannot study the creative process, but we have to study it in a serious way. I mean, we have to um, engage. We, we not only should, should look at style, but we should look also at the meaning part of the artworks. So this is part one of my talk. And now I'm going to part two and I'm going to do to talk about the case study. Now, just a little question here. Do, do you, I, I have no idea because I don't see anybody and uh, I don't know whether you're still listening or not. So maybe a sign of life. Is anyone listening? Listening. Yes, yes listening. Okay. Yes, we are listening. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> OK, so I'm going to do a case study and um, the case study is for painting. Um, I'd love to do it for music, but that's for another day. Um, and so uh, I've been studying a particular painter who is called uh, Luc Tuymans. He's a Flemish painter, uh, but he is uh, actually uh, quite well known, and, you know, doing uh, worldwide. He's on the top of uh, painting at the moment and then uh, innovator of figurative painting. And so this is uh, the uh, Palazzo Grassi in Venice. And um, uh, he did a solo exhibition in the Palazzo Grassi uh, last year uh, and the year before, I mean, in that season. And so this, this is the entrance of the Palazzo Grassi and you see a mosaic here on the floor. I will not talk about it, although that could be, is really interesting also. And then if you walk up the stairs of this monumental building, because it's an amazing uh, building also, uh, then uh, you see here, you walk up and then there's this painting, Secrets. And this is the painting. And so I'm going to talk about that painting. Uh, so it's, it's the first one you see in the exhibition. So the, the painting, uh, Secrets. Now, if you look at it, well, I guess you see uh, the face of a man. And, uh, you know, this man has closed eyes, which could reflect that he's sleeping or maybe he's dead or he's, he's doing a meditation or, you know, something like that. I mean, this is sort of the first um, first reaction, uh, possibly. Uh, but then 
uh, if you read in, in the catalog the, the description, you know, then the first sentence says the closed off inward looking face of secrets is in fact that of Albert Speer. Um, now, I guess most of you know Albert Speer or have heard of him. He was one of the Nazi criminals, uh, a close collaborator of uh, Hitler. And so this completely changes our, our view on this painting, right? So it, it is really secrets is about hiding something. And uh, it turns out that Speer always denied that he knew about uh, the atrocities of the war. And so, so this painting has this kind of double, you know, double uh, experience or interpretation, right? Uh, and, and this is true for most of the paintings of uh, Luc Tavros that you, you look at uh, maybe an innocent image, which then evokes again a whole set of meanings. And, uh, and so I, I did an experiment to see in how far, well, what it would take just to, to kind of model the interpretation process when looking at this painting. Um, now, uh, clearly, we, we will need to, to do uh, well to look at the experiential level. So this the visual processing or the auditory processing in the case of music, you know, feature detection, structure recognition, source detection, all these things. Uh, and then there's the interpretation process, which is more semantic, which is about semantic recognition and the expression on the face, like I was discussing for uh, Caravaggio and, and the whole cultural context, because we are talking about uh, Nazism and so on. And all these things, they they also, when, when we look at this, the, the, our personal dynamic memory is very important, you know, because we, if we detect structure, recognize the, the source, like Albert Speer in this case, who is on the painting, uh, this has all to do with, with memory, with um, um, uh, remembering things. And uh, so, th so this is what we're talking about. If, if we're talking about interpretation of, of artworks, then we have to address this issue of how memory works. And I, I'm, of course, not talking about memory in, in a traditional computer sense, but the semantic memory and episodic memory and how they uh, they interact. So what um, the first thing I, I've been doing is to, to create or to define a data structure, which I call a transient narrative network, which is going to progressively build up all these connections and this web of meaning that uh, we talked about also for Caravaggio. And, uh, you know, this is a small snapshot of, of that network. And uh, I'm going to talk about how, how this network was built. Um, now, I should also say, I don't see the slide here. Uh, oh, yes, here. I don't know whether we didn't see this slide. Oops. Okay, I have to restart my PowerPoint. Um, sorry. Oh, talks. Okay, uh, is everybody still there? Yes. 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 Um, okay. And uh, do you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Um, no. Yes. 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 
Yeah, you see it? Okay, I was here and now I, sh I show this. Yeah, you can see it? Yes. Okay, so what I did, well, you can of course write papers, but um, which I haven't done yet. Well, not yet about what I'm talking about now, but uh, I also made an exhibition actually in uh, Bozar in uh, Brussels. Uh, Bozar is uh, a big center. It's like the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Um, but it also does concerts and um, anyway, I made an exhibition called uh, Secrets, uh, AI and Luc Tamos. And this is a view of the exhibition. And the important thing is that uh, when you walk in, you see the real thing, you know, the the artist uh, Luc Tamos thought uh, that, that this was crucial that you would see uh, the, uh, the the painting and not the digital uh, version of it. And then we had all sorts of dialogues that I held with uh, Tamos, which you could uh, watch and, and see. And then here you see uh, this is part of the, the visual processing and this is part of the uh, this transient network was made visible in the exhibition on on big uh, screens. OK. So um, so I cannot explain this whole network. I will just give a few examples of how I, I built this network. And uh, basically we can think in terms of challenges. And so for AI, you know, challenge is similar to the ones that we uh, solve when we look at the painting. And the first uh, challenge has to be recognize the source of the image. Now, there are various algorithms that, that can do this. And so um, with uh, uh, Bjorn Waal and, and Sinem Aslan, you know, and also uh, myself, we've been uh, trying out uh, different algorithms. And, well, the first one is actually we can use Google uh, reverse image search to find the origin of this. So the original picture that was used for this painting. It turns out when, when you do that, well, uh, the, the, how Google is doing it is not known, but um, you know, they, they use a combination of techniques, but certainly they're using also image compression uh, so that uh, every painting is sort of projected into, let's say, an uh, n-dimensional space. Um, I don't know, maybe eight, ten, hundred dimensions. And then there's a nearest neighbor. So you, you, what you see when you do a Google search with an image, this is what I did. You know, this is what you see for, for this painting. And these are all the, the, the uh, images that are close to the original painting. Um, now, what you see, I mean, this is interesting. The, these turn out to be actually all, almost all of them are paintings by Luc Tamos, actually. Uh, but what we do not see here is the original source that we're looking at. Uh, interestingly, when you use another search engine like Yandex, this is a Russian search engine. You know, it's it's probably using very similar techniques and you see it. It is creating images that are similar in some sense, but you, you get uh, differences, maybe more Russian looking. I don't know. Um, and this is for uh, Baidu, which is a Chinese uh, search engine. So, you know, these differences, I think, uh, particularly to do with the uh, data, the corpus of data that was used to to train the, the network that is doing the uh, image compression, because uh, typically they use uh, some convolutional uh, networks and, and deep learning to for this particular task. So nice, but we don't get to the uh, original, uh, you know, the original image. Now, as I said in the catalog, that it says this is Albert Speer, and if we type in Albert Speer, then of course we get in Google, for example, we get lots of candidates and it's not we see immediately that this one here is a possible source of the, the painting. And we also see that this one is actually cut out from a, a, a bigger uh, uh, photo. And so this is indeed uh, this way we find the uh, original source. 
which then uh, the painter also uh, confirmed, you know, confirmed th that this was the, the source. And this is source is taken. Now you see here already part of the artistic method of the painter, because in the in this painting, all the uh, the uh, insignia of you know of Nazism, which were very clear in, in this painting here, like the armband um, and also these uh, buttons here, they're all removed from from the painting. In fact, this line here and this line is the only thing that that may remind somebody of the military uniform. Uh, also, the color is is much more gray, and I have to say this is a digital image, so the color is not necessarily, you know, if you see the real painting, the experience is is quite different. But anyway, um, we see that the color pa palette has been reduced considerably. So these are already things of the artistic method of this particular painting, uh, the, the selection, the cropping, leaving out iconic features and uh, I, I looked at many other paintings of, of Thanos, particularly all the ones from the Palazzo Grassi exhibition. And then you see that he's using these, these artistic, this particular approach regularly. So th this is uh, using the search uh, facilities, but you know, if we really want to go further, then, then we have to be able to align those two uh, the, the painting and the source image. And one technique which is used a lot actually uh, is based on identifying key points which are like, you know, based on statistical features or um, uh, on, on contrast or things like that. And, um, and then trying to find the mapping between the, these key points and uh, between the the painting and the original image. Now this looks nice, but actually it is very wrong. You know, you see, uh, I mean, this point is linked to this point. This point is linked to that. Well, that would be right. OK, so here is where the, the mapping is correct. But uh, and the nose here, this point is linked to this point. But actually many of these points, I mean, this part of the ear goes to this thing here. So for for aligning the the, 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 the source and, and the, the painting, uh, this, this method is pretty useless. And I think this also explains why uh, search engines do not find the original image because the, you know, the artistic method is, is transforming the original image. It's doing something just like if, if you and um, Bach is using in the choral, he may, he may be using a uh, bass line, you know, which is coming from an existing melody that everybody knows, but then he's transforming it and changing it, or you know, jazz musicians also, they transform and change the, um, the jazz standard that they, they used in, in their, uh, uh, you know, in the song that they are, they are playing. So, OK, uh, this is uh, when, when we try to, to map here, you see the results on the left. When we just superimpose the image onto the painting or the painting onto the image, I mean, um, uh, this is the uh, original uh, image. And this is the, the image like transformed based on the mapping that we could compute from this, uh, the, this particular technique here which you see it doesn't uh, is not really what we want. Now this is a much better result and it's actually based on uh, on on the transform transformations from the painting to the source and then using a kind of uh, search a little bit evolutionary search algorithm that is trying to find the parameters of the these translation scaling rotation you know the, the to, to do the transformation from the uh, the, the original uh, source to the painting. And so once you have that, you see, we now have a way that they they map onto each other. It's not perfect because because the, the painter has clearly deformed uh, the original image, like the position of the ears. You cannot really nicely match it anymore. Um, 
one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so this was an, an example of, of uh, processing. Here is another example, which is, this is another painting by Luc Tamans called The Valley. And this is about finding the focal point, because if you look at this painting, uh, at any painting actually, the, there is a, a first region uh, to which your eye gaze is drawn. And, and the painters, they know that they paint their painting so that it, it would go to a particular position. And for this painting, you, you know, the, the two eyes is typically where you go first. And then your eye gaze goes around, uh, maybe then looking at this area or, or looking at, at this uh, a bit weird uh, hair, uh, you know, uh, thing here. Uh, and so these are all algorithms that, that that try to find this focal point. This is the best one, the MSI algorithm. Sorry, it's not MIS, but MSI. Um, Poolnet is another one. And so these are the results of other algorithms. So actually what you find if you do this, uh, this challenge is that, you know, you have to search around for algorithms until you find one that is doing the job more or less the way that that you would expect and so this this idea of ai which is propagated in in the media and, and by uh, philosophers and management consultants and so on that that you just need a lot of data and and that's it you you're done i mean this is completely uh, wrong right you you really have to work hard to get a particular result and so this is the uh, msi uh, network it's a relatively recent um, network, but this is the one that, that we used. And this is then applied to secrets. And so the interesting thing, particularly if you compare to the original, is that the focal point here is, is in the middle. You know, it's on the nose. It's not on the eyes, which is the, the most natural focal point for a face, is to look at the eyes. So here it is really looking and and why is that well i i talked again with uh, timons about this and this is this idea of closed off right he wants the face to be um uh, closed off as opposed to to here you could say it's it's, it's open or blank or normal uh, and then you you are focused on the face but here also he he well there is some emphasis here on on this area that maybe you you have a tendency to look more at this eye rather than than this one. But anyway, so this is interesting because it's it's already a first uh, little example of a feature detection and uh, a pattern recognition. In this case, the, the focal region identifying the focal region that is meaningful. That it, it is a signifier. The fact that the focal point is here in the middle of the the, the 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 painting and not sorry of the face and not on on the eye has to do with uh, it, it's a carrier of meaning right it wants to express something uh, here is another example i i, I just show, show a few challenges that we tackled and and tried to solve but this has to do with um uh going towards emotion um and uh, towards eye gaze. Uh, and so there is, again, this is a big field in itself, right? Uh, face recognition. And uh, we, we played around with uh, some existing algorithms in this open face uh, platform. And then what they do is they, they detect the face, they, they detect the facial landmarks, which are points on the face that can move or that are significant. And then es estimate the eye gaze, estimate the head position. And from then, they, they then um, uh, do um, uh, extract all sorts of features. Uh, in particular, what is called action units. These are the, the parts of the eye, that, oh, sorry, of the face that can move. And that they use that then in many applications, including what is called emotion recognition. So we applied all that to, to the um, secrets and, um, and also to the uh, original image. And you know, what you see already is that the, the, this is the eye gaze here. Uh, so the, the original, the, the eyes are sort of looking 
outwards. And here clearly the, the eyes are, are, you know, inward looking. So remember that in the catalog, that this was the first sentence of the catalog, the description, by the way, by the curator, uh, Marc Donadieu, is, is actually uh, really excellent because he starts by saying closed off, inward looking face. And so this is outward looking and, and here it's, it's uh, inward looking. Now, there are lots of other features actually that, uh, uh, well, you can derive, let me, um, well, before I say this, I should say uh, one experiment that uh, that uh, we've done, this is also with Sinem, is to, to take the painting and redraw it with a reduced palette. Uh, and also this with a reduced palette. So what that means is that we do we use a clustering algorithm. We say, for example, suppose there are only five colors. Uh, what are they? And then the clustering algorithm will will find you know five colors. And then we can use these colors to redraw the the painting. Again, the, these colors they they look maybe very similar, but you know on on a screen, um, and particularly after compression and all that. The colors are no, no longer very exact, but anyway, and it turns out that if you apply this face recognition uh, software to to this face rather than this one, then certain features become apparent that are that maybe you didn't see at first sight. I mean, once you know it, they are there. But uh, for example, the the you could see that the lips, you know, there are tight lips here. There's a kind of uh, moustache here. Uh, you see, there's no moustache here, but uh, this is what's called a toothbrush moustache. Now, once I pointed it out, you can indeed see this. So this is a suggestion of a moustache. And of course, when you say, you know, this, this kind of moustache, it has uh, connotations with uh, military, with hierarchy, with uh, um, dictatorship, uh, with Hitler and so on. But you also see the, the nostrils, the open nostrils, the uh, thick eyebrows, you know, raised eyebrows. Um, so these are also, again, compared to the original, right? And so the interesting thing is if you look at, at the original and then look at, at the painting, uh, is, the, is the differences, because that's where the artist uh, it comes in action, right? This is the difference between somebody who is trying to make a nice portrait uh, based on this photo or an artist that's that's expressing things that's expressing meaning by changing position by uh, you also see the face is much more rectangular than than it was in the original and all these things so but anyway if if you here is an application uh, these are these action units and uh, applied the blue line is for the painting, the orange, orange one for the original picture, and the gray is for this, uh, the painting with the reduced palette. And then you can see that the, the eyebrows here, right, this is all about eyebrows, uh, the, this raised uh, thick eyebrows, and this is about uh, lips which are tight. And some features you see better in the clustered uh, image, like here, uh, and others you see better in, in uh, or in, in the in the painting. For example, here this is uh, is called blink, which is uh, actually means closed eyelids. So you see, um, this is the original image. There are no closed eyes eyelids, and this is the uh, the painting. So some of these you know, are very easy to uh, to to pull out once you, you do this uh, analysis. And then they do em emotion recognition. I, I must say this emotion recognition is a uh, is very far away from human emotion recognition. They, they just take six or seven uh, supposedly human emotions and then they map these features uh, onto them. I, I don't think this is very close to humans, but anyway. OK, and then the, the final example I want to give has to do more with uh, contextualization um, and with, with interpretation. And so how are we going to do that? Well, um, 
I don't know whether I can show it on the screen actually. Um, um, do you see my screen at the moment? Yes. Uh, do you see text razor? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, now I have to do a manipulation because my system came down. Uh, so I'm going to take a, um, a the description from the catalog. So this is a live demo here. Um, from the La Pelle exhibition at the Palazzo Grassi. So you see secrets here. And uh, let's just take uh, the first paragraph. You know, and now I'm I'm using uh, a system called um, a text razor, uh, which is now about um, the uh, the semantic side. Okay, and you see the state of the art in in this area. This is language processing we are doing now, and so you see that. Um, these are the words in the that have been identified in the uh, in the first uh, sentence. Uh, these are the phrases uh, like minister of armament, uh, relations, the entities, and and what is interesting here is that these are links into the semantic web. Okay, I don't know whether everybody in CSL is familiar. Well, you probably heard the word semantic web, but semantic web is really um, a kind of, uh, you know, well, uh, a universal namespace for uh, for going into various kinds of uh, semantic resources. And one of them, I just did it here, is the is Wikidata, which is the uh, the analog of Wikipedia. Uh, but in, in in the semantic web, and you see uh, here you have all sorts of uh, information about in, in this case it's about Albert Speer uh, images, and so the search engines and the uh, language processing and a lot of applications AI applications are relying on on knowledge graphs like like this one here. Uh, there's also the uh, Google Knowledge Graph that um, you know you you can tap into, and so this uh, this system here, but this is just an example of the kinds of systems you find today, are giving you pointers into um, uh, DBpedia, for example, or uh, into uh, Wiki Data. Uh, some of them go into the Google Knowledge Graph or the Baidu Knowledge Graph. And so these, these knowledge graphs have become uh, incredibly big. Uh, the, the, the Google Knowledge Graph, for example, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's something like 10 billion facts which are in this graph. So this is a huge graph which is used, which represents you know, all the restaurants in, in uh, Venice or in Paris and what kind what food they have and people and, and anything that that is known, uh, let's say, can be extracted from websites and texts is 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 compiled into these graphs. And so um, it's also this is a dependency parse, which is uh, familiar to, to those of you working in the language group of uh, CSL. Um, you know, this is so so you get uh, syntactic parsing here, you get entity named entity recognition, you get also all sorts of uh, categories um, that that give the context of uh, of in this case of uh, Albert Speer. So the Nazi party and, uh, uh, you know, anti communism and all of those kinds of things. So actually, if we are talking about the uh, the semantic side of the uh, interpretation process, then we we can attack this uh, using these knowledge uh, sources, uh, and using also ontologies, using dictionaries like uh, I mean the, the Oxford English Dictionary is also online, and all these resources can be queried with APIs. 
So you have to imagine a sort of message passing system uh, or also Tesauri like Webster's Tesauri is, is, is uh, addressable by APIs. And um, so this is what I used to build this network is actually at first the uh, you know the, the pattern recognition and the um, open face and all these kinds of things which are giving um, uh, categories like tight-lipped, closed eyelids, etc. But then if you uh, like if you look up tight-lipped and uh, I don't remember it was maybe Cambridge uh, English Dictionary or something. It is giving you all sorts of connections. And so you, you can build a graph uh, progressively. Uh, do you see this graph here? Uh, can you... uh, do, do you see a graph appearing? Yes. OK, so this, this, is, uh, this is now information coming from the semantic resources that is progressively building up this uh, transient uh, structure. You know, it's like the title secrets. It's also putting into the network these um, things like detecting the focal region and then looking inward, you know, which is related to self-reflection or closed off face, which is uh, related to hiding secrets. And so all these things like the tight lip relation to to, um, uh, to to reluctance to speak, lips pressed together, et cetera, et cetera. So part of this network is is built by uh, by the results from pattern recognition, but then by going in, in thesauri and, and in dictionaries and in ontologies to to start interpreting, of course, from from the resources of this uh, this dictionary, and then after a while, actually, uh, the network is is uh, focusing or network construction is focusing on the the cultural aspects. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go a little bit further on this. Uh, so here, um, you know, now it's about Albert Speer, right, and the uh, going into Wikidata and coming up with um, with uh, things about fascism and Nazi and then making connections with Hitler authoritarian and this uh, uh, toothbrush moustache and etc. And then going into other at the Palazzo Grassi, going into the name La Pelle, which is the name of a film by um, based on a book by Curzio, Curzio Malaparte, which is about the liberation of Naples by the American troops and, you know, the um, uh, moral decay of war and, you know, you could you could see the idea, right? So, so this is, um, uh, this is a kind of uh, maquette, if you want. I mean, uh, not all of this is automatic, uh, part of it is, but it is, it is useful to, to understand the kinds of problems that that we have if we um, if we try to to computationally model this interpretation process, and so it's clear that AI can can be used to study the artistic methods, to study the how the painter goes, why a painter picks a pa uh, a topic, and how he goes from an uh, existing image, uh, how he goes to the painting. And we can also use it to study the artistic interpretation process, uh, as I showed. But in fact, you know, all of these algorithms, um, and uh, particularly also the language processing, is pretty shaky. And uh, like, uh, it's clear that we, we need to use construction grammar, we need to use frame extraction, semantic frame extraction, all these tools that we are using, uh, we are working on also at, in CSL uh, to go much, much further if we, I wouldn't say, you know, reach an equal level to humans because humans have this huge semantic memory, all these experiences that they can bring to bear on the interpretation of an artwork. But it's a, it's a way to go. It's not completely, um, 
useless, uh, you know, things we can do today we could not do five years ago or ten years ago. And this is not only due to um, uh, pattern recognition with neural networks and so forth, but it's it's also due to the incredible developments at the moment in the semantic web and and uh, everything around it. So I want to conclude with uh, some comments on uh, computational creativity. Um, not many comments because I think my time is up. Uh, I have no idea of the time. So, but um, th the first one is this idea of the artist as a cognitive engineer. You know, when I talked quite a bit with Tamans and of course, uh, and also with, with composers and um, the way they work is much more, I would say, deliberate than is often made out to be. I mean, there's this romantic idea of the artist who sits in his, uh, you know, gets inspiration and then boom, boom, and you have the, the artwork. But actually, it's all very well thought out. I mean, in the case of music, every note which is in, in, the, in uh, this piece by uh, Strauss, is there for a particular reason, you know, and, and there's no uh, arbitrariness. It's all part of the design and of the, uh, and, and of course, when we listen to it, we, we don't pay attention to all of this, but uh, it has the effect. It's the effect that counts. So the, like in As Dunkel Schon die Luft, you know, As Dunkel, you feel actually, if, and I, I suggest you listen again to it, you know, you you feel this whole thing of the the valley becoming darker and and uh, the air becoming uh, dark and so on. Uh, it's it's being expressed uh, by uh, well by the, by this um, uh, uh, melody rhythm, but also this this uh, the harmony. You know, the 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 change in tonality and things like that. So this is the uh, what these artists are able to do, which is uh, very remarkable. Um, now, if if you talk uh, a lot of work on computational creativity, basically uh, people use templates or grammars or constraints, and then uh, there's usually some random number generator or some you know randomness factor, which which makes it that the, the, the work is created, is generated by filling in this template and by making some random choices in, in filling the whole thing in. And if, if uh, well, we used to write these templates by hand, like uh, grammar for sonatas uh, or the grammar for Mozart uh, arias or something. And now it's uh, the, the, these templates are derived using um, deep learning or other statistical methods, but they're still templates. Now, I think if we take this idea of the artist as a cognitive engineer, the, the artist has methods. And of course, he has some uh, design patterns, you could say, like in uh, architecture, you know, where uh, you, you use, uh, you don't always start from scratch to think about uh, a window, for example. So you have, uh, uh, design patterns and also in software we use design patterns but uh, but we have this uh, or the, the artists they have artistic methods on how they do things and they have to do with uh, managing the very complex design problem that they are trying to solve and so if we talk about creativity computational creativity from in terms of creative from the viewpoint of a creator of a work, uh, we really have to, to go much more in the direction of understanding artistic methods. And uh, of course, with, with constraints and uh, coming from, let's say, compositional theory or from uh, color theory and so on. But th this is where the, the creativity lies. Uh, okay. OK, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen so that I, I can see, I hope, uh, people in the room. Uh, yes, it's nice that I see some people, 
partly because then I recognize, you know, CSL, the garden. Uh, <laughs> I recognize Peter. Hello. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, an uh, Alessandro. OK, hi. Uh, you know, Alessandro was a partner in crime for one <laughs> of uh, <laughs> my artistic uh, uh, elaborations. Uh, anyway, let's let's open the floor. I, I hope I didn't talk too long. Vittorio, you have to put an order of questions. Huh? I, I'm not the chairman here, but I have ah, a question. OK, you're so not I, the chair. OK. <laughs> no, I can start actually just a curiosity. Of course, I mean, we, we, we I guess we both agreed that creativity stands on the human side and not on the technology side. But uh, a, a typical question people are wondering about, I mean, in these days is, is there any difference between AI and all the other technologies? that typically artists have been using, I mean, for, for centuries. Uh, so do you see a specific difference between AI and what, I mean, was before, or is just, I mean, um, somehow AI, a specific hype here? And we, we tend to, to associate, I mean, sort of uh, cognitive abilities to AI that makes it a little bit different with respect to other technologies. Yeah, so this is about uh, the use of AI for helping in, in the creator, let's say. Huh? Um, and uh, well, AI is about algorithms and about. Uh, um, and so if you write a, a composition, for example, you know, sometimes if, if you have a, a melodo melodic line uh, for a violin and then you want it to be played by another instrument. Well, if you have to write it out because it's in a, a tuned in another way, you know, this is a, you have to start unless you are very experienced. Whereas with some algorithm who can do these uh, uh, things or you want to, to, to have something in another tonality, you, you push a little button and it happens. And so this is the way, of course, this is like the techniques that have been used in the past, but they go further in, in a certain sense. But I would say that these are these are not about the the core. What what makes artistic, uh, you know, and uh, what makes it art, right? These are tools like you would. Uh, I mean, you would use, uh, for example, a, a tool to synthesize uh, your, what you have written so that you can hear it. All these kinds of things are also like in the, for the Palazzo Grassi exhibition, uh, Luc Tamans actually curated himself the, the order of the paintings in the different rooms. It turns out they make a, a complete uh, 3D model in, uh, what is it, SketchUp or something like this, uh, so that they can simulate how they are walking in, in the exhibition space and they can play around with it uh, before they actually put up the, the paintings, you see. But I, I think this is all good, but this is not what people argue when they say computation and creativity. This is AI as tools, and that, of course, is fantastic. Yes, totally agree. Thanks a lot, Luke. Thanks for the fantastic talk. I leave the floor to others. David, we cannot hear you. Yeah, is there this facility for raising your hand? Oh, yes. Yes. Right. Pietro. Hi, Luke. Thanks for the. Hello. Um, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, thanks a lot, and it's a pleasure to see you after all this time. Uh, I wanted to ask you one thing about the use of AI, now it's 
we, we talk a lot about how AI can support artists, but what about the people that are actually going to uh, see the piece of art? Do you think that AI could support their experience? In, I mean, like uh, providing context information would be a very obvious application, but do you think there could be others? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, one of the motivations of uh, my project. You know, because in the um, Beaux-Arts exhibition, you walk in and you see the real painting, right? And then you walk around, it's in a, in a wall, and then you go around and then you see this, this network being built up. And you see all these results from visual processing. And then you go back out and you see again the painting. And your experience of the painting is completely different, you know, yeah, because you you've seen all these connections, uh, not only in the in the visual level. You 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 now have seen the original picture, you know, and and uh, what the artist has done with it. So so your your experience of the artwork as a viewer uh, is enhanced, and so uh, now. This could be implemented in other ways, but it actually works quite well in, in this exhibition format. Um, and so I think also for education, for example, or for preserving the interpretation context uh, of a work, uh, which is also one of the motivations of, of the painter in this case, because.